Good morning, folks, and uh, welcome to our COIL conversation today. My name is Larry Reagan. I'm uh, one of the co-directors of the Center for Online Innovation and Learning, and it's my pleasure today to welcome our guest, Debbie Cavalier. Uh, Debbie is the Vice President uh, for Online Learning and Continuing Education at Berkeley College of Music. I want to, want to make sure I got it right this time. <laughs> And just by way of a little bit of a background on this, um, Berkeley has been involved in delivering online programming for about 12 years. Uh, recently, I'm going to say the last three or four years, uh, under Dee's leadership, uh, she has developed a MOOC strategy that connects into, in many cases, in their online program. And we're very interested in learning about how they do that. Um, I was at a conference in June where Debbie was a speaker and her president was a speaker, the president of the, of the college, and he stood up and said, thank you, thank you, thank you. But I have to tell you, everything we've done, everything that we've done successfully has been because of Debbie. And that got my, uh, my attention right away. So she continues to lead the program up there, both the online uh, development program. I'll just tell you, because I'm impressed, they've got uh, about 150 courses and 10,000 learners. Just by way of a reference point, Penn State has about 800 courses and 15,000 learners. So if you look at the numbers there, we're not learner-wise. Uh, Debbie and her team are doing really, really well, and we've got a ways to go. Uh, Debbie's also a, uh, a musician. She's a Berkeley grad, and uh, she was part of a 2011 Grammy Award-winning CD for Best Children's Album for their anti-bullying song called Walk Away which I can just picture the walkway. I can, I can see Steve Martin in there somehow joining you. Um, she it, it continues to perform. And uh, if you want to look on YouTube, you can find Debbie and Friends. Just do the Debbie and Friends, and you'll come up with her, with her work. Really, really cool stuff. Uh, Kyle Peck's already tuned into it for some relief <laughs> from his other children music for his grandkids. So. so Debbie, it's been a pleasure having you with us for the short time that you have, and we're really looking forward to uh, forward to your insights. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Thank you so much for having me, Larry. And I just want to say that it was very nice what Roger Brown said, but I, I have to say that we've been successful because of our wonderful staff and faculty. Uh, it never happens without them. That's yeah. right. I'm, yeah. I'm very aware of yes. that. Trust me. Yes. <laughs> thank you. So thank you. Yeah. yeah. So should I take it away? Yes. OK. So just to give a brief overview about Berkeley, uh, Berkeley has a campus in Valencia, Spain that's relatively new over the past few years where we've got master's degrees. Um, of course, the campus program, our, our flagship program, has been in existence since 1945. And um, Berkeley was founded on a principle that you could teach music through music of the day. So we're a contemporary music institution. We were founded in 1945 when jazz was music of the day. So uh, we've got a rich tradition in jazz. But if you walk the halls of Berkeley, you'll hear everything rock, pop, hip hop, um, Americana, you know, roots music, anything considered contemporary music. And uh, our president, Roger Brown, often says, we're not an institution that curates music, but rather an institution that creates music. So we're sort of a, a lab for new contemporary music. Debbie, before you go from the screen, can I just take a wild guess and say that really cool building? Not the one in Boston. <laughs> that's right. The white, the white helmet the there. Boston. Yeah, that's Valencia. That's the arts and sciences area of Valencia, Spain. And we were very fortunate to occupy um, real estate there and, and offer fantastic programs. Yeah, um, I've been to the one in Boston. The, the yes. Photo. Very nice facility. Yeah. Beautiful studios. You, they were really when, good. when you hosted us in June, uh, you also had students playing as part of our reception. And it was unbelievable, the quality of the program was just unbelievable. Yes, thank you. Our students are amazing. And you mentioned my Debbie and Friends YouTube channel. Channel. I would rec recommend that everyone check out the Berkeley College of Music YouTube channel because okay. our students are featured on there performing. And it's Very really cool. terrific. So um, Berkeley is the largest music college in the world with 4,000 students on campus. And as you mentioned, the online school has 10,000. And the online school was started 12 years ago. And I'll tell you a little bit about that history. But we offer courses, certificate programs, our online degree program is relatively new. We've got seven majors now. And um, the focus of this discussion today is our MOOC strategy. So I've highlighted that here on this slide. But uh, just to mention that Berkeley Online is an outwardly facing organization. We're, we're designed to expand the reach of the college and provide music education opportunities to students all over the world who you know, probably dream of going to Berkeley. And, and Berkeley Online is the way that they can 
realize that dream. Um, so uh, the portfolio of our offerings are listed there as sort of as a timeline. We've been teaching courses and certificate programs for the whole time we've been in existence. We entered the MOOC space in 2012 and signed on with both Coursera and edX. We've got 11 MOOCs and a dedicated MOOC team now, so we'll be really uh, building out that category. Um, we also did a partnership with SNHU about a year and a half ago and created a co-branded uh, MBA program. So SNHU offers the MBA core, and uh, Berkeley Online delivers four uh, very specialized music business graduate courses tied into that program. It's been really successful. SNHU is a wonderful partner to us, and they do all the marketing and enrollment, and they send the students our way when it's time for their, their uh, Berkeley courses in the program. And finally, this past year, after several years of a lot of work with uh, you know across campus and our team and our faculty, we are now offering Bachelor of Professional Studies degree programs. We've got seven majors, and um, I think it's very interesting to note that our degree program tuition is 62% less than the campus tuition. We're really using the online school wherever we can as a way to address affordability issues. And uh, we've got a lot of students who left Berkeley for various reasons, finances or otherwise, who are using the online degree program now is a way to complete their degree, and it's, a, it's really been a wonderful thing. So focusing, um, well, taking a look at our whole uh, areas, the areas that we represent online, Roger Brown, our president, came up with this metaphor that we're running with, the Berkeley online wedding cake. And um, as you can see from the bottom to top, we go from free to degree. And as you move up through the layers of the wedding cake, the costs increase. But um, so does or uh, the access to faculty and the intimate small cohorts. So um, I'd like to think that we have something for everyone who is interested in studying with Berkeley. The enrollments that we, we see on a yearly basis, or this is how we're tracking right now, a million students in our MOOCs um, per year, 3,000 in the courses, about 6,000 certificates, give or take, and then 500 in the new degree program and we're prepared now to welcome 500 more this fall, which is very exciting. Can I interject sure. with a question? Um, so do you have a sense of the path from that 1 million to the 500? Have, are they coming from, potentially from those MOOCs? Is there a trail there? Yes, it's really been exciting to see. The MOOCs have, done, uh, have addressed one of the initiatives that we wanted, which was raising the visibility of Berkeley Online. Mm -hmm felt after 10 years, when we entered the MOOC space two years ago, that um, we were still the best kept secret at Berkeley Online. And so indeed, um, we have 19 degree students right now who found us through their MOOC studies with us. And uh, we have documented over the past two years more than 300 students who found us in the courses and certificate programs who came by way of the MOOCs. So it's been really great for making people aware of what we offer. Thank yeah, you. sure. This is hard to see, but I just wanted to show um, the Berkeley Online Continuing Ed team. We have a team that is 60 strong in four main areas. Our marketing and recruitment team, the marketing team, the uh, advisors, um, really important group that uh, nurtures the students through their program. Uh, the tech team, which has built a lot of the technology that we're using and has also integrated third party solutions that we're using, such as Salesforce and Marketo. Uh, wonderful teams. Our operations teams for, for uh, business operations and customer service uh, are listed there. And then our academic team made up of instructional designers and uh, video producers. Also our Berkeley Press editor-in-chief is on that team. And our not rep represented here on the academic team um, is our new two-person fully dedicated to MOOC uh, team. So that's that's the Berkeley Online team. We also have 150 online faculty working with us, and um, another more than 100 on a waiting list that we'd like to teach for the online school. It's, do, it's do you mind an interruption? Not again. at all. Because oh, it's it. here, yeah, and I'll yeah. remember. So those two new MOOC developers will they also become part of the online development team? Are they integrated in with that group? Um, you know, when we started with MOOCs two years ago, it was a very much of a side desk activity for our dean Karen Nuremberg and her team. And the workload really grew. And it, it was an experiment at the time that proved successful. So we wanted to dedicate resources. Um, so we have a curriculum manager and a video producer. And 100% they're focused on. Mm. And the curriculum manager also manages the relationship with 
Coursera and edX, a lot of administrative things um, that need to take place. Um, so yeah, they're 100% focused on MOOCs. But they do leverage resources within the course development team as needed. So instructional design. Do they think and act? Like a uh, like a team, like they're not a separated down the hall. That's right. No, area. they're very much a part of the team under our dean, Karen Nuremberg. Okay. Yes, and uh, the leaders of these teams, Mike King on the marketing recruitment side, he's our uh, chief marketing officer, and on the far right, Karen Nuremberg, our dean, been with us since the beginning. It's, it's a mm -hmm. nice thing. Berkeley Online has a lot of folks were at the table when we said 12 years ago, let's start an online school, and so it's uh, it's nice to see. Our faculty are working with us as third-party contractors. They're wonderful performing musicians with you know, inspired careers and really um, have been very innovative and, and wonderful partners to us. Our, authors, our faculty authors earn a royalty for the courses they develop with us. And um, they, they really do fantastic work. And they're paired with our instructional design team to create their courses and MOOCs. Our students are, it's, you know, this is just a small sampling, but performing musicians who are studying with us while on the road. So Stefan Lassard is the bass player in the Dave Matthews Band. He's taken a lot of courses with us over the years. Frazier T. Smith co-wrote the song Set Fire to the Rain with Adele and says in this student spotlight video how his studies with Berkeley Online have affected his approach to producing her most recent album. Um, Suzanne Chani is uh, in her 60s now. She's known well for sound design back in the 70s when uh, she actually created that Coke can opening sound with sound design, which was a big thing back then. And now she's studying with us to learn about online music marketing and ways to engage with her audience in the 21st century. So it's been nice having her. And Nico Ellison represents one of many military students who are studying with us while deployed around the world. We also have a lot of retired folks who always dreamed of going to Berkeley and their parents wouldn't let them. Uh, coming back to us with one guy that was studying at Eastman and wanted to go to Berkeley. So he would hitchhike over to Berkeley in the 70s and take a private lesson with Gary Burton oh my and hitchhike God. back. And <laughs> now he's studying with him online. Wow. It's really a neat thing. That's very cool. Yeah. So now to get into the strategic goals for our MOOCs. As we've talked about, you know, with 1.5 million enrollments, it's really helped to raise visibility for all of Berkeley, Berkeley Valencia, Berkeley Campus, and Berkeley College of Music. I'm sorry, Berkeley Online. Um, and also diversifying our portfolio, creating that bottom layer to the wedding cake. The next four bullets I'd like to kind of dive into with, uh, with examples for each. So Berkeley prep MOOCs uh, for prospective <coughs> music students. So this is an example, developing your musicianship. We did in cooperation with the academic affairs team and um, basically said if, if you wanted to have a course that students took before they arrived at Berkeley so that they would be successful and, and have a firm understanding of the language of contemporary music from a theory, harmony, ear training perspective, what would that course look like? And so George W. Russell Jr. is one of the most beloved faculty members on this. He um, is the, the, the instructor in this course that was done in collaboration across all the different departments on campus. And what's nice about this course is it teaches the language of contemporary music and it uses, you can see in the upper right hand there, uh, George working with real Berkeley music students. So he's playing and singing through examples. They're singing with him. Um, bottom left is where he's really breaking down the music theory information. And then bottom right, you can see Shannon Jacob is a Berkeley College of Music student talking about how ear training has transformed her songwriting and just uh, real world practical applications of how the material that you would study in this course applies to your making. Not pictured here is um, another element of this course, course, which is at the end of every lesson, there's a Berkeley student ensemble performing. Very inspired um, video production of Berkeley students performing. So it's, it's like a Berkeley immersion experience. And we really did create it to help students. When students uh, are going to audition and interview to, be, to apply to Berkeley, they are all you know, given this presentation to go through when they show up for their audition. Um, but we are also finding that musicators are taking this MOOC, um, saying they came up through a conservatory model and really want to learn how to incorporate contemporary music into the classroom. The next bullet for strategic goals for MOOCs for Berkeley is uh, philanthropic. So a lot of what we've been doing is you know, creating MOOCs that lead to paid courses. And that has worked well. 
But we also wanted to use the MOOC space as a way to give back and provide music education opportunities for underserved populations. So we recently had a, a wonderful opportunity through our development office to, um, we were given a, a grant from the uh, Inter-American Development Bank to develop this very course, Developing Your Musicianship, in Spanish and in, in Portuguese. Not just captioning and subtitles, but an actual you know, uh, instructor whose lang first language is Spanish with musical examples that are more appropriate uh, than would be in this class. And uh, we've rec we're in the editing process now, and this is going to go live in the catalog next week. Mm -hmm. And the a really nice thing about this also is Coursera is doing a, a Spanish language uh, push with a Spanish app and all of that. So we're going to be able to introduce this course, Developing Your Musicianship in Spanish, uh, as part of that effort. And um, once that's complete, then we'll be doing the same thing in Portuguese. We are also captioning and uh, translating all of our MOOCs. But this is going to be a truly Spanish MOOC with uh, Enrique Gonzalez, who's a wonderful instructor. Is there a particular reason you picked that one versus music theory? Or that's, do you have a sense that this is one that will resonate with a larger audience? Yes, that's a really good question. This really is like a music theory course. Okay but a more of a 360 approach to music. So music theory is one thing, harmony, ear training, um, overall musicianship, working in an ensemble, singing, you know, just all the different elements. So it's a, it's a more uh, well-rounded course than a music theory. Yeah, but same idea. You know. Oh, how nice. Yeah, our newest student in this course is right here in the room. student yes. is Kyle Peck. Uh, he just signed up this morning after breakfast with Debbie. He, he immediately signed up. Because I think it starts, Kyle, on Monday? Actually, that's one of the rolling and rolling terms. Oh, OK. Starting time. Yes, on demand. Recommended deadlines, though, for those of us who are here. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's studying the class right now and not paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> So getting through the strategic goals for MOOCs, uh, another one is music industry partnerships. And this has been a really good thing. Um, Berkeley has a lot of industry partnerships. The, in, this example is one with a company, a German company called Ableton, that makes a music production software application called Live. And it's a recording, producing, and live performance tool. And uh, it's very popular. And so Erin Barra is on the songwriting faculty at Berkeley. And she just happens to be an artist who's endorsed by Ableton. And they were very excited about the idea of us creating a MOOC, producing music with Ableton Live. And as you can see on the right-hand side there, that's the Ableton Twitter page where they have 213,000 followers. And see that they promoted our, uh, our promotion for that MOOC to their audience. They also did a lot of promotion on their website. And we wrote on their email newsletters. And apparently, there were more than a million people that they reached with that. So uh, in addition to Coursera's vast exposure um, and wide reach, we're working with music industry partners to expand that reach. And the first enrollment for this was more than 50,000, which is a lot for us. We're usually around 30,000. And it's been successful. And one of the reasons we were able to do this is that Live has a free version. So still, no barrier to entry for mm -hmm. students. If, um, they can download the free version. We're now doing this with a called Avid that has a um, kind of the de facto standard recording application called Pro Tools. So they'll be a producing music with Pro Tools free. Um, and, and all of these courses uh, have a paid version. And even um, Pro Tools we use extensively in our music production degree programs. So these are all kind of uh, feeders into those, those programs. I have to say, I think that's a brilliant strategy. Of of finding those industry partners um, who then have products available. We were fortunate in one of our online learning, I'm sorry, in one of our MOOCs to have found a relationship. It was a uh, graphical uh, information systems GIS program and uh, partner in um, Esri, in, who's the largest provider of the software, same sort of nice. model. Yeah. They were very enthusiastic, very excited, and it, and it met our students' need. It was yes. a, a Free. So I, I just think that's brilliant. Yeah, I love yeah that. that's great. I'm glad to hear. I haven't heard about uh, any other. Well, so only, it's only one that I'm aware of right now. But I, I it's think a it's a model. great model. Yeah. Great model. Yeah. And uh, finally, recruit students to Berkeley. So I thought it would be 
kind of fun to, to walk through how, mm. how that works, how we've been doing that. So this is a snapshot of uh, a lot of our MOOCs on Coursera. Uh, jazz improvisation from left to right, developing a musicianship. All of these courses you'll see, Introduction to Ableton Live, are basic courses that provide an on-ramp to our paid offerings. Um, and if you were interested in studying jazz improvisation with six-time Grammy winner Gary Burton, you can take his MOOC and you won't really interact, you won't interact with Gary in that format. You'll learn his approach. He's codified his approach to teaching jazz improvisation. It's a wonderful MOOC. But if a student really wants to study with Gary Burton himself, it's just you know an amazing opportunity. You, with just 19 other students, with Gary for 12 weeks, where Gary is the one who's critiquing your assignment on a weekly basis. Then we have a paid offering for that, which you can see for three credits is available uh, for 1449. And um, one nice anecdote is that Gary said, with the thousands and thousands of people who have been taking his MOOC when he tours around the world, which he does with Chick Corea all the time, in his audiences are typically a handful of MOOC wow, students, whether it's Japan cool. or you know wherever he is. Yeah. Yes, then the, we offer in the paid offerings credit and non-credit. Non-credit is just $200 different, um, difference, but um, the same learning experience? experience is exactly the same. same and the experience. teacher, unless they look, really can't tell. It's, it's not the level of engagement, but rather where they are in their lives. Whether I'm just curious in that model, how much interest do you get in that non-credit version? It's only about 15% of our course takers opt for that. Mm -hmm. And we're really wondering if how much value we're adding that um, we, I can't tell you how many people have wished that they had been taken for credit uh, because they've decided sure. the certificate program is what they want. Sure. Or, yeah, so something we'll, we'll continue to revisit. Mm -hmm. So our marketing approach for recruiting students to Berkeley through our MOOCs is, uh, here's a small example. So if you were in the Introduction to Ableton Live course, MOOC, then throughout the course you would get these messages from us saying we've got additional content if you'd like. Um, in this case, Aaron has created some additional Ableton Live videos. And if you'd like to, to download or have access to those videos, uh, you, you are taken to a landing page where you give us your name and email address. And as you can see at the bottom, we, we blew that out a little bit, but there's an opportunity to subscribe to Berkeley's online newsletter or be contacted by a student advisor about studying with Berkeley Online. And this has proven to be really very successful for us, and it also makes you that way you become aware of, here are our paid offerings. All, all of these relate to Ableton Live. Um, advanced production of Ableton Live, composition and producing electronic music, um, and the list goes on. This is just a, a snapshot. So the results of this kind of activity in two years are that we've had 350,000 people give us their email address and say, yes, please contact me. I want to learn more about studying with Berkeley Online. And from that, Oh, I didn't update the slide, sorry. It really is 350. <laughs> <laughs> From that, we at the time had 15 online degree students. That has uh, grown since um, I put these slides together. There are 19 online degree students that came, found us through the MOOCs. And 322 certificate program students who found us through the MOOCs. And our certificate program rate from three course certificates to 12 course certificates. So, um, so if I could just uh, interrupt there, would those these are the certificates that you offer. Not I know Coursera also oh, offers right. the, the signature track certificate. You're talking about the ones through your institution. That's right. Okay. The Berkeley Online accredited work, work credit okay, certificate super. programs. We yeah I didn't talk about that, but through Coursera we have become part of the their certificate offering, offerings, which they call specializations. Mm -hmm. We have one called the Modern Musician which um, looks at music production, songwriting, um, a couple of other courses, and a capstone. And, uh, that has done well. Yeah. So future plans for Berkeley MOOCs. I mentioned that because this has been a uh, you know, successful experiment over the past couple of years, we made a business case and got approval to add a two-person MOOC team. And they just came on board this summer. And they're hard at work right now on that Spanish MOOC, finishing it up for the launch expand those offerings with that two-person team now, um, going after market-driven MOOCs and more specializations, their certificate programs, continue along the path of translations and captioning. And one thing that we haven't talked about here at all is um, also the notion of sponsorships. So we've identified a couple of folks through the development office at Berkeley that are interested in, in having a MOOC created that they want, and they will be um, 
there will be attribution to the catalog level. So if you, for example, if they funded the um, guitar course, it would say this course is made uh, possible by you know, a person or an entity that funded it. Hmm. Yeah. Would, would they? Um... Would they also potentially be driving the topic areas that you might select? Say an industry came in, like go back to, um, is it Ableton? Yes. If Ableton came in and said, hey, we would really like to do a MOOC around, um, I'm sorry, you didn't actually need to go back. I was, okay. just, I, I was just sort of thinking, if they said, hey, we'd like to do one around music editing or something, yeah. and we'll pay for it and sponsor it, how would you manage that? So I, I think uh, Berkeley has always been good about making sure that um, that we think about the students first, and and so if if we if we're able to monitor demand for sure. that idea, then we would pursue it. But we wouldn't um, we wouldn't just do it because the money was there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I don't know if I, think I talked about how we monitor demand. It's really just a survey method um, where we send out a survey to our registered users and ask them, you know, here here's a list of courses. Are you interested interested in taking? These. And that list comes from our faculty. It might come from a potential donor someday. Um, it comes from our student advisors who say, you know, getting a lot of requests for a course like this. And we ask our registered users. We also partner with industry. We might say to the folks at Ableton Live, Ableton, um, can we send out a survey to your registered users? We're interested in pursuing a course like this, but want to get some input. And so those have served us well. It doesn't sound very scientific, but over 12 years, uh, that has informed our our curriculum development. Sure. Quite well. Yeah. You know, I, I find that uh, again, smart strategy of working with these um, the, the business partner relationship. If you're going on for a profession in the music industry, yes. you would need to know some of these tools, anyways. That's right. And and so a smart move on the part of the company is to get their brand and their name of their editing suite, whatever that might be front of students. And, yes. And, and so I can see why they'd say, hmm, this would be a relatively inexpensive yeah. investment. Yes. I mean, for whatever it might cost, which we can talk about later, you know, they're spending a gajillion dollars on marketing, and this is a way to get the product and its use, especially if they have that free version in front of their students. I, yes. I think that's great. Yes. And, and also aligning with the Berkeley brand, which goes a long way for these sure. industry partners. Yes. It, it works out very well. Yeah. yeah. So I, think I, I interrupted you from your list. So oh, sorry, sorry about that. No problem. I think that was pretty much at the end. Um, the sponsorships. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's Terrific. the Berkeley MOOC story. Terrific. So, um, so at this time, uh, I have a short list of questions, as you might imagine, but I'd like to hear from you as well if you have questions for Debbie. Uh, for those of you who are online, I'm going to ask you to use the uh, chat box. And uh, uh, our colleague Brad here is channeling. Your questions, you'll put it into a format and uh, get it to me uh, for Debbie or get it to Debbie. But uh, in the room here, any questions that uh, you want to start off with? Anne? Kyle's going to be our mic run runner. Oh, okay. oh there we go. Oh, oh, two mics. Dangerous. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, thank you so much. I'm just fascinated with the direction you've gone, and you really are the flagship for how to do arts education online. Thank so you. thank you for sharing. And I have, um, that's my question really, is that putting arts education online, it has so many unique aspects to it that not only affect design due to the increased media um, yes. that you're reliant on, um, but pedagogically, when we're talking about arts education, we're often talking about studio, private lessons, yes. small group ensemble, large group ensemble, you know, comprehensive collaborative work, and I'm just curious, how is the art of playing or doing or musicking coming alive in these classes? That's a great question. Um, and I have to credit our dean of the performance division, Matt Marvulio, who has really been our champion in figuring out how to do, uh, how to teach music instruments online. And um, he's really, he's been uh, very instrumental in our success in the categories of guitar and improvisation and uh, bass, drums, voice, all of that. We, we have not conquered or even tried uh, the real-time performance experience. Berkeley is an Internet 2 institution, and we are Internet 2 connected to our Valencia, Spain campus, and there's some really interesting, amazing things happening with that. Or a recording session, students can be recording in studios in Valencia and mixed uh, in Boston and vice versa, and just all kinds of great things. But we, 
for Berkeley Online, we've always tried to develop to the lowest common denominator, whether it's connection. When we first started, people were still on modems. And we want to make sure that this experience is optimal. And anything that we try to embark on, everybody has a successful experience. So real-time performance, there are some great strides that are happening. And I think we'll get there. But the latency right now is still too much to embark on. That said, we really have, I think, had great success with instrument lessons, let's say um, the blues guitar course, for example. By having one instructor and 20 students go through 12 weeks of lessons, and, and the students are doing an assignment every single week, every student in that course, if they have the initiative, can listen to every other student's assignment and read the critique of the instructor for every student's assignment, including their own. And by following a rubric that's set up every, for every assignment, also critique their classmates. There's so much learning happening. Yeah, yeah, it's really. Um, so I've had the great fortune of being in a Berkeley on campus classroom from time to time, um, you know, take a songwriting course with somebody who's going to be developing a songwriting class with us. And I love the moments where a student plays their song. And, you know, but there's only so many songs you can listen to in a class setting. And um, I'm always the first to say there's nothing better than going to Berkeley on campus. That's a wonderful experience. But for those who are studying with us online, these kinds of things are really powerful. And, uh, and it's working well. Yeah. I was just wondering, uh, do your technical or design staff or, or any of your staff really have a background or interest in arts education or music education? Yes. It seems at Berkeley, with few exceptions, no matter the role, they're in a band, you know. Um, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. So if I go to work for Berkeley, I could be in the band? Yeah. <laughs> Usually you come already having been my in the band. Lifelong, <laughs> my lifelong dream, Kyle. I see you on a, on a can outside drumming on, <laughs> <laughs> on a corner someplace. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. for our department, um, you know, retreats or time away from the office together, um, we'll do things like take over a performance venue on campus and just have you know every iteration of every combination of person creating music together, you know, jamming together. We had a power outage in the Back Bay area of Boston a couple of years ago, and everybody just pulled out their instruments, and we all just started playing together. And so it's a real musical environment. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that Berkeley has very low turnover for staff and faculty. Um, we're all there because of a common passion for music and a desire to learn and, and perform. So, and and then the folks that don't play an instrument, they just have this great love of it. And um, so, yeah, it's a place that attracts all of, all of that. Yeah, great question. I, I want, sorry, go ahead. Please, you're a guest. <laughs> uh, Two-part question. And thank, thank you again for coming out. Oh, my um, pleasure, Chris. Thank you. What's the turnaround rate to create a well-developed MOOC by your faculty? And the second part to that is, who owns the intellectual property? Is it more the institution, or is it more the authors or co-authors of that MOOC? Great question. So um, our, it depends on the timeline that it, uh, it takes to develop a MOOC. It's very dependent on the author's availability. But we go into it with an agreed timeline. So we can develop a MOOC as quickly as two months or as long as six or eight months. But whatever it's going to be, that's determined in the contract that the author signs and we agree to with developmental milestones along the way. And not so much with the MOOCs, but with the 12-week courses. A lot of times, authors go in with the best of intention, but realize it's more work than they maybe have time for. And so those milestones and those agreed upon dates and, and the kill clause uh, is a, has been an important thing for both sides. Yeah. Um, our faculty authors earn a royalty on the courses that they develop. Berkeley owns the IP, but they, the authors earn a royalty on, um, on the MOOCs as well as the paid offerings. And, um, I, I think that's been one of the real um, important factors for the su success that we've enjoyed, is that our faculty authors are our partners. And when Pro Tools 12 comes out with Pro Tools 13, we're not calling the authors. They're calling us saying, I need to update my course because it's you know they're not going to want an outdated version. And, and they want to know, is that instructor doing the good? I'm not teaching my course anymore, but I want to know that I'd like to talk to that instructor because I heard maybe he was late on grading or something like that. They have a real vested interest. I mean, they're wonderful educators, and they care about the student experience very much so. And being an author that has a royalty just makes them even more invested in the life of the course and how it's going. 
Yeah. Sure. Is the suite of tools you've developed for your online courses, is that also used in your face-to-face -face courses? You mentioned the ability of an instructor to, we saw an instructor leaving sense of video feedback yes. and the critiques. And you said, I was really impressed when you said every student can see the critiques of other students' yes. works and actually add their own critiques. So all that, all the tools you're building really to support the online are benefiting the face-to-face -face as well. Is that right? Yes. Uh, so the face-to-face -face right now, the Boston Campus Program, is using a different LMS. Um, they're using Moodle Rooms, Moodle out of the box, as opposed to our heavily customized version of Moodle. But I mentioned in the last session, and I'll, I'll mention here, that we are moving to a new platform. Uh, we're going to go with the open source version of Canvas for our regular program and build on top of that the student experience. So an application that talks to open source version of Canvas through API calls. And um, when we have that created and we incorporate all of the requirements, which they're, they're different for the campus program than our, what we've added their requirements, addressed their requirements, we will someday be all be on one platform. So it is happening on campus, but with a different tool set. Yeah, and, but that's a moving target and moving towards a unified uh, approach. Yeah, we have a new CTO who believes in this, uh, uh, David Gregory, who came to us just recently from Smith College. He's fantastic, and he's going to uh, help to see that we're all on one, which will be nice. Yeah. If I could uh, channel uh, a friend of mine up in Alaska this morning, Heather. Hi, Heather. Nice <laughs> to have you with us. Um, Heather is asking about the potential complications of being on two different media platforms. And uh, maybe considering a third, like how do you how do you balance out the overhead and the maintenance of those relationships and potentially different delivery systems? So you're on Coursera and on edX. Oh, those platforms. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yes. So Berkeley Online is currently on a heavily customized version of open source Moodle, and we have a systems administration administrative team that is responsible for making sure that that's up and running. Um, and we have a content management system that our course development team uses to develop and publish out uh, the courses in that Moodle platform. Um, developing in the edX platform and in the Coursera platform has been a real benefit for our course development team. It's opened their eyes to other ways, and it's given them a community um, of folks that they didn't have access to before that are also instructional designers. And um, it, it's helped to inform this new tool that we're building, you know. Um, so I think it's been a really positive thing that they're, they're playing in other yards and, and uh, bringing that back to our future plans. Um, we're not hosting or responsible for those other platforms, edX and Coursera. We're just developing in them. It's been sure. a growthful professional development opportunity for our team. Very good. Thank you. Robert? Sure. Talk a little bit. Um, I'm a systems administrator. Oh. Can you talk a little bit about what your hosting strategy is. How do you? Is it physical, local? Is it out in the cloud? Is it? What are you doing? Yes. Yeah, so I'm soon going to go, go past my expertise here, but I can put you in touch with our brilliant systems person, uh, Joe McDonough. is just incredible. Um, we use uh, Amazon, uh, AWS. Yes, and uh, Joe is certified. Uh, Amazon for, for this, and he's done it in a way that um, if a whole region in the country goes down, uh, people could still do their music homework. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, our uptime is fantastic, and um, it's actually one of the reasons why we chose to go with Moodle open source rather than, I'm sorry, Canvas open source rather than Canvas hosted, because we think we can um, maybe do a better job with keeping it online. Yeah. And just to follow up on that, you said if one region of the country goes down. Yeah. How about international? So Joe would have to be the person to talk to about that. I'm not sure. I wouldn't, I, I don't know about that, actually. Yeah. More to um, intellectual property questions. OK. Do you have any concerns about, or do you have discussions about hosting content that, that is the university's uh, intellectual property on servers in clouds outside of the United States? Um, yeah, I mean, cyber liability, cybersecurity is, is a, always a big concern. Um, and I, I would be hunting if I tried to really. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. But I can have you 
I can put you in touch with Joe, who could, yeah. Okay. We can talk to you about that. Thanks. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Any other non-technical questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got one from yes. you from, a, from another friend in um, Knoxville this morning, Alicia. She's one of our uh, learning designers at the rural campus. Okay. Uh, she lives in Knoxville. And she's asking about the uh, instructional design of the of the MOOCs. Are they designed for a peer-to-peer -peer type evaluation assessment, or is it primarily the learner and the content? You, you've already stated that the, the original online author is not in there as if it were an online course. This right. Is where we draw the line. We, we build the instructional model. It's their course content, but once you get that, so Alicia's asking, how much interaction do you do devise between learners, or is it primarily the learner and their content material? That's a great question. It, we've really um, leveraged the peer-to-peer -peer assessment approach with the MOOCs. But I think it has a long way to go. I think um, the, the uh, anonymous nature of that is troubling, uh, especially when you put your heart and soul into writing a song. And some anonymous person critiques it and doesn't get what you were trying to say with it, and there's nowhere you can go with. But this is what I meant. You know, it's just this. Yeah. So I think it, it. I think it will be more impactful to peer-to-peer -peer assessment than if there's a face to to it. You know, I'd never thought of. I'd never yeah. have thought about the personal nature yes. of what they're creating as an artist. Yeah. Is uh, a little bit different than me putting together my three reasons for the Civil War, right? Right. right. And having a peer person respond to it. That, yeah. that is an interesting dimension. Yes, and we've had we've had students um, you know, feel very very frustrated by that. So yeah. I've made a case to the folks at Coursera and edX to you know think about how, how can we take a little. And I also think people will be more a little more compassionate in their critique. Sometimes it can get a little brutal. Oh, anonymous yeah. can be really yes. tough. Yes. Yes. Because I can hide behind that. Yeah. You know, I, I wonder, and I don't know whether um, Coursera would do this or could do this, but is there is there a place to build an entry, a, a doorway? Mm. I go through the doorway, but when I go through that doorway, in order to have this engagement, I sign in, yes. I have a you know a profile or whatever. For those individuals who wish to go there, there's something there. Yes, that, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that before. I think they are experimenting with cohort models like that. Yeah. And I think that would be that'll make a big and I have seen MOOCs that, that prepare peer reviewers yeah. talking about, OK, what you're about to do here is not to be taken lightly. Yes. And yeah. they, they talk about the kinds of words you can use in, in peer reviews and which kinds are really constructive and helpful and which kinds are not. Yes. If, if anybody here, you have experience with that. It may have been in some of our own MOOCs that I saw that time. And we have some designers here. Do you want to yeah. add to that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Gary. <laughs> Art, an art MOOC, it involved art making. Mm -hmm. Some of the same experiences. Um, uh, so we have a very talented data analysis team around the MOOCs here. And one of the interesting findings from that art MOOC was that the peer portion was um, sort of this bimodal love or hate kind of situation. Yeah. And I think a lot of it had to do with the individual experiences of people. So they did get incredible, some people got incredible value mm -hmm. out of your feedback. And then some people were the victims of awful humans who decided to trash all of their artwork yeah. for no reason. Mm -hmm. And when we tried that the first time, we at the time, we couldn't figure out a mechanism for stopping it, really. Yeah. And in fact, we couldn't even limit the number of your assessments. There were people, we could see them, um, doing 70 or 80. Oh my goodness. And they were all horrible. Wow. Like they were just going through and, and marking everything low. And I don't really understand, but that's a, that's yeah. a different aside. That's a psychology class yeah. <laughs> someplace down the road. I don't know what you do about that. Um, but in terms of the peer feedback, what we tried to do was really uh, have carve out some time to educate students on the purpose of critique and yeah. what, it's, what it's for and what it's not. I think there's confusion uh, from novices. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. The word itself maybe sounds more negative than positive. Right, right. right. And so what our attempt was really to try and bring them along in, in, um, on both sides, on the giving and receiving side, to yeah. understand the culture of um, providing and receiving feedback on creative uh, objects or its creative right. pieces. That's mm. the best we could do. Um, it's going on in our four credit online courses in the college as well. Uh, we have some graphic design things going on. And we're, spending, we're trying to spend enough time on it 
some of these are general education offerings, so they're not students in the arts. We're trying to give it the, the time it needs so that, because if we feel like if we can prepare them once for it, then it will change the dynamics sure. over the entire yes. semester. So. Now, I'm even wondering, Gary, if there's an opportunity there to create almost a standard module or something that, mm -hmm. so say you yes. had this cohort right. method where people are going to go into it. If you say, to get into this door, mm -hmm. you must complete this protocol and maybe even provide some samples or something. Yeah. I yes. don't know, but, but, I, but you're right. If you can, if you can teach them once. Right. It's, it's, it's interesting because it, it's kind of, you can look at it two ways. There, are, there's work going on in peer review that tries to give someone mm. judging something mm -hmm. numerically. But that is a, to me, that's a little bit different from kind of the kindness aspect right. or the human the aspect, cultural aspect, um, yeah. where it's really not necessary to act in certain ways, and sure. it's not helpful. Yeah. Anyway. And so, um, I think we could work on both. I, we've been looking more at the second one just because I feel like um, looking at the survey feedback and the data we got from the art move, it was a serious problem. The people who felt abused, it, it very adversely affected their experience. Yeah. Wow. That's unfortunate. Um, yeah. I guess since I have a mic, my question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> whether or not your group is doing, what you're doing on sort of the research side, because as Ann mentioned, this is incredible stuff. Those of us in the online arts area would love to hear uh, what you found. Um, and I was curious if you know, if, if that's an area of your operations that has been explored in terms of um, collecting and analyzing and sharing um, research uh, uh, around online uh, arts education. You know, we're really starting to dig in now. Um, we're just starting to do that um, as it relates to every aspect of our, our business. We're, we're trying to, to measure everything, whether it's, um, you know, a marketing spend or what's happening in a course, what what are the, the metrics that will point to student success? It, you know, is it a good grade on that first assignment? Is it a, an instructor who is um, more active in the discussion board and timely in the feedback? You know, we'll have 10 sections of Music Theory 101 run, running with maybe five different instructors. Who, who's got the best retention rates and why? And so we're just starting now. Our, our techno technology team has evolved and changed, and our new tech leader is uh, really a partner to me and our dean in this right now. He's um, embarking on a major analytics project where, where the focus is student success. Um, you were talking earlier about um, you know, rubrics and, and teaching people how to critique. We do that a lot in the paid offerings. So there's a getting started section in every course where you learn, you know, in this course, part of your, uh, to, to complete this course successfully, you, you need to critique five assignments per week using you know these criteria and um, kindness is absolutely you know part of that as well so um, we, we haven't really had any issues like we're having with the MOOCs with arts critiquing uh, because of that I think the getting started uh, and the way the instructor models critique as well yeah but um, you know, invite me back next year and I'll have a lot of information about, <laughs> about, about the research we're, we're embarking on now yeah I'm going to go to Robert, and then we'll get. It. Oh, okay. Do you want to do Ann first? However, he had his hand up first. Um, can I uh, just uh, so as somebody who has survived many, 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 many writing workshops? Many what? Writing writing workshops. workshops yes. So fiction writing. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you also prepare people to receive feedback and understand the ability to uh, filter? Because I mean. You know, part of that is being crushed. I mean, you sure. Just, you go in and you get crushed. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. That's how it goes. You know, one of the ways we've been able to do that without even trying directly is to change the modality for delivering critique. So when we started the online school 12 years ago, the only way to provide critique was text-based, and you can impose all kinds of horrible tone and judgment. Um, it, it's hard to to receive critique uh, in written form. Um, without you know turning more sour, let's say, than it needs to be, and we built these tools where in the discussion board, um, rather than typing, you just click a button and you can speak your critique, and so the audio you can hear the empathy in the teacher's voice, and you can hear them say, you know, you played it like this, but maybe try this, and 
um, or it might be some text plus an audio file. And that just lifted everyone's spirits because it was like being in a room with somebody. And, um, and then we added the video tool, which um, I don't know if it further improved it, but it was just another way, especially for performance courses where you could see the guitar when they're saying it. But um, delivering critique via um, audio and hearing the inflections and the, and the sentiment has made a difference. Uh, but we never actually said, this is how you should feel or, or think about, this is what you should think about when you get to the teeth. But we have really worked hard to, to train folks on how to give a critique. because, um, And that was a reaction to some, some pretty bad displays early on. Yeah. I, I can tell you that, that, that I've, been, I've just been through a lot of bad displays. Ha, have you? And mm. the technique that was used when I was in the, the program was you not only got you know, a discussion of your of your work, but also everybody's written copy. And there were just people who it wasn't valuable to read. Yeah. But you learn that through. And and I know people who have dropped out of writing because of that? It, that they couldn't survive that. And I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Right. Because the world is a cool place. Yeah, mm. yeah. Wow. It would it would be a great researchable Topic to say what happens when you have feedback that's text or yes. visual, and yes. it may be that people get get too nice when it's visual when they know yeah. they're not being seen, and you know. Good point. Uh, but it would be, and then compare that back to the experts, kind of a, a rating too, which might be more realistic or something. So that's, yeah, that's a good researchable topic for anybody out there. <laughs> I don't know if too nice has ever happened, but. <laughs> This question swings away from that topic. I hope that's OK. Yeah. Um, I am very intrigued by your online degree programs. And I see that as a real viable option, uh, particularly for artists who are having to make the choice, do I educate myself and lose my financial freedom for the next 10, 20, 30 plus years, um, or do I try it on my own? Um, was this development of degree programs part of the strategy early on? Or did you reach kind of a, a tilting point of having enough online offerings that it became an option? Or could you talk to us a little bit about how sure, that Sure, great questions. So we always thought from the start that we would go from courses to certificate programs to degree programs over time. And it was the number one request from our students right along. Um, one of the reasons it took us so long is that we built everything ourselves. And so we were not tied in with the college's ERP system colleague. Um, and that was going to be a huge, and it was a humongous un undertaking. We never doubt, you know, we're, we were not in the world of financial aid or any of that. So it was um, a lot to learn, a lot to uh, staff up and ramp up for. Um, in fact, the partnership that I mentioned with SNHU, the co branded MBA program, was wonderful because while working out with them, working on that with them, they taught us a lot about delivering degrees online and what matters to um, busy adult learners. Quick aside, um, a lot of our learners come to us from three or four institutions. And with a job and a family and all of that, getting their transcripts is just it's a big task. So SNHU says, sign this. We'll get them for you. And they took what was a four-month process and brought it down to two weeks. So learning a lot of lessons learned from them was, was really helpful. Uh, but uh, the online school, President Roger Brown really wanted us to leverage the investment we've made to uh, provide affordable options to students. And flexibility, and you know, you wouldn't believe how often, or maybe you would believe, that uh, a Berkeley student the dream of coming to Berkeley, but then another dream happens. They get they have an opportunity to go on the road with you name the name, and um, and they have to make a choice between their education and their career. And so now with the online school, they can do both and continue their studies with us. And we have a lot of students that left the college when finances ran out, or you know, with and without a degree and with debt, and now they're finishing online. So it's serving a lot of mission-driven initiatives. So it's always been in the plan. It took us longer to get there than we had hoped. But um, the last thing I'll say is that we did set the tuition at 62% less than the campus tuition. So it truly is a tool to uh, to address affordability issues. And that's been nice. Is that less or 62% of? 62% less, 38% of. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. So I jump in, and I'm watching our time dwindle down here. But I, I'm just, I, I wanted to ask. So out of that list of strategic reasons for moots, yes. finances was not up there. And I don't, so, and the reason I say that is, well, OK, I understand if we say, well, finances of, you know, there's not going to be a return on the moots. 
but it doesn't appear to be an expectation that you're driving enrollments, that there's a metric down the road that you know, you've increased your online enrollment. I find that really interesting. Here we think about that. We talk about that yeah. a fair amount. Yeah, it, it is driving enrollment, and we have uh, we have financial goals. You know, uh, mm. Berkeley Online is seen as a entrepreneurial unit. We have a P and L uh, and expected uh, revenue goals and and surplus generation for the campus. So it's all uh, built in, and uh, we have seen that the MOOCs are are contributing to that. So those conversions, the 322 certificate students and the 19 degree students, that revenue has come from MOOC activity. In addition, the certificate revenue, the signature track revenue, is more than paying for all the MOOCs now, um, that the revenue that we're seeing from students opting in for cert certificates. That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah so it's, yes, Chris? Um, so a lot of these questions are on what I'm about to ask you, but when we went to that funnel and we saw that you had three, I think it was one million all the way down to 322 certificate. Um, my question is going to be regarding retention and attrition rates. Of those 322, how many actually then go into a degree seeking program? And because you said online learners in HRO, it's like they're juggling flaming chainsaws, let's be honest. They're yeah. kids, they got extracurricular yeah. obligations, you know, family obligations, whatnot. How long does it usually take to complete the certificate? I think, I think I'm looking because that's a I work for World Campus, and my students, you know, uh, they might come in for maybe, let's say, a semester or two, and then they are off for a year. Yes. So I'd like to see how long it takes for your students to complete the cert, and how many of those that complete it then roll that into a degree seeking. Um, it's a really good career. question. Yeah. So um, our certificate programs, we've got three levels. Specialist is three courses. So they could take that in two semesters, or, you know, depending on their, on their life, or how many they could take at a time. Professional certificates are five courses in length. And we have something called the master certificate, which is master as in guru, not degree. And um, that can be between eight and 12 courses. And um, again, it depends on the student's schedule. It's pretty flexible you know, how many they, uh, courses they can take in a given semester. We offer four semesters per year. And um, they, they move through it pretty quickly. And we are seeing tremendous conversion from certificates to degree programs. It's as if. They defaulted to a certificate program because we didn't have what they really wanted, and now we do. And so they're transferring those credits in as they align with the degree program. Uh, I don't have exact numbers on that, but I can get back to you on, on that. But it's a huge percentage. The good news is that we're, we're continuing to see new students into the certificate program. So it's not like that area of our business is dying, but it, it is feeding into the degree program. Yeah. I'm sure that's where you, your institution really sees the impact of how the MOOCs really from the whole funnel yeah. to degrees, that's where it's paying its dividends. It really is, yeah. It, it, um, and then, of course, the, the, a lot of times the MOOCs are just visibility raising. And you know, I had an example yesterday, if I could tell you. Sure, of course. Of, um, of a, a father that wrote in to his instructor. Um, this gentleman was taking a course, a music business course, and wrote to his instructor that his was to go to Belmont, which is one of our competitors. But because of his experience with Berkeley Online, he's bringing her to Boston to get a tour of the Berkeley College of Music campus. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Berkeley Online itself, even parents are affecting uh, enrollment. The online degree, the campus degree, it's, it's kind of a neat thing how it all works together. Yeah. I think that's yeah. a testimony, too, though, of the quality level that you're establishing. I would imagine that you're very sensitive to what we're putting out there, whether it's MOOCs or online, this represents our name and our brand. Yeah. We want to do it right. It's true. And thankfully, we have the support of the college. So we were, I think we were set up for success. We were set up, funded well, and staffed well, too. Yes. So we're very lucky. In that well, I think you have a lot to be proud of. This is, this is marvelous stuff. I think you're, the strategies you're using, um, you know, the business relationships, all of that, it, it's great. And I know you were. A driving force behind uh, it. You can be humble, but I know you're a driving force. And and on behalf of uh, our Penn State in in room as well as our our guests, yes. some Penn State, some not online with us, uh, say thank you.